All right, let's finally get started. Uh, let me make sure I got sound going. Yeah. All right, sorry for the long delay. Internet went out on me midway, started the wrong slides. It's just been, uh, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so this is probability and sampling. Um, we're going to talk about an example first, though. But first and foremost, uh, I had a question. Um, the midterm is next Tuesday, so October 18th. Uh, so, Seems weird considering it's only a 13th. How is it already the 18th by Tuesday? But it is. Um, so uh, midterm is next Tuesday. We're going to try to get to some review today, uh, but there will be more review and discussion section tomorrow. Um, I don't know. If, did you post the midterm review guide yet? No. Okay. So midterm review guide will hopefully go up today, but maybe tomorrow uh, as uh, some more support for that. Um, but uh, you will also have access to these slides. So even if we don't get through them all, you can kind of see all the things I think are important to be aware of. Um, and that's about it. Uh, one more quick thing, right? Format is at the moment, a portion is written and then the portion is uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, I'm on the fence about making it all Jupyter Notebook. Um, so you may end up with no writing, but we'll see. Uh, you know, it depends on whether I can structure the questions in such a way that you can't easily look them up. Uh, which is the hard part of write, writing an open book test. Yeah. All the lectures be included? Or? Yeah, all the lectures are included. Um, you know, so, some stuff I think, or what will be highlighted in here is kind of the stuff that's most important, right? You know, I'm not going to test you about Galpin, for example, but I'm going to test you about the stuff we talked about with Galpin. Does that make sense? All right. So first and foremost, Monty Hall problem. Has anybody ever heard of Monty Hall? All right, who's Monty Hall? Oh, okay, you just heard of him? All right, anybody, anybody know who Monty Hall is? So he was a game show host uh, a long time ago um, and hosted a game show called Let's Make a Deal. Um, he may have hosted other stuff too, but uh, he got, like the Monty Hall problem got really famous from that show. Uh, and what's funny about it is that uh, there are, in all references to the to the problem we're going to talk about, um, there's a lot of goats mentioned. But I remember watching the show as a kid, and I think it was even in reruns then. Like it's really really old, um, and uh, I don't remember there being any goats. So maybe it wasn't all the time. But basically, the Monty Hall problem is um, you're a game show contestant, okay? And we're going to tell you that there is a prize like a car behind one of these doors. So now pick which door you want, okay? So let's say you pick the first door, okay? So then what happens is Monty Hall, the host of the show, um, will open one of the other two doors, okay? And that other, one of those other two doors, as you might imagine, is going to be um, the not prize door, okay? So there's a few cases here, right? You either pick the prize, okay? Uh, and so either one of these, they'll open, you know, Monty will open, or you didn't pick the prize and one of these, he knows, is the, the not prize, okay? So like I said, in most of the stories about it is the goat, okay? Some people may like goat. I just actually read the other day that something like 70% of the red meat uh, consumption in the world is actually goat, which I was really surprised by. Um, so if you take worldwide, obviously not in the US because goat is pretty rare here. Um, but long story short, uh, so you get a goat, um, and but otherwise you get a car, okay? So the problem here, right, the math problem is if you chose this and Monty opened this, should you stick with your original door or should you go to this door or does it not matter, okay? So the choices are um, stay with your door, choose the third door, or it doesn't make any difference, okay? So raise one hand, raise your left hand for this door, right hand for that door, and two hands for either, it doesn't matter. Okay, this is, uh, well, let's see. I don't know, we got like maybe 50% are saying it doesn't matter. Okay, so that seems like it would be the case, right? That you would have essentially it's like a roll of the die, right? Is that you You roll the die once and then you roll the die again. So you have the exact same chances of getting any given face. But in this case, it's actually not true. It is a better choice to choose door three. 
because the problem hasn't actually changed. And it's also key that Monty knows where the doors are. So he guaranteed picked a door that was bad, okay? So, and we'll get into why in a few minutes. But it's, it's really, and why it's so famous is because it was part of a game show that was hugely popular. And then uh, basically the uh, uh, kind of the normal commercial media, you know, kind of picked it up, right? There was an original publication in a stats journal, you know, that I'm sure, you know, all five or six people in the world read. Um, but then it actually hit mainstream media. That's what I was looking for. Uh, and it became a hugely popular thing because like many of you, most people didn't believe that it was better to choose door three. All right, so uh, speaking of goats. So yeah, uh, this is a well-covered problem. You know, there's like a Wikipedia page, a little nine yards because it's super famous. Um, but we are going to talk about it in terms of Python. Okay. And actually, actually one second. Make my life a little easier. Okay. So, as I kind of mentioned, let me make sure my cheat sheet is here so I keep track of where I am. Uh, do you have questions? Did I put the wrong one in the yeah. This should be 11. Um, Does it look like this? No, no, no. Okay. All right. I must have just dropped the wrong one in the folder. I have to change them every, every time I teach a class, right? Because we go faster or slower depending on the class. So sometimes I, I mess it up. Uh, let's see. You are a class. Uh, actually, anybody who's in there, can you tell me, is um, is united.csv in there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I must just grab the wrong one. Okay. All right. So 11 is in there now. Should be correct. Comedy of errors today. Of course, you have a ton of stuff to get through, so you know that's making fun. Okay, so options, right? So your choice happened to be the goat. You don't know this, right? But it's goat one and goat two and car. Okay, and so we're just kind of we need to know which goat it is. But it's always a goat is the lost prize, right? So the other option is that you chose goat two. They reveal goat one, and then the other choice is a car, and then the, your choice is a car, and then goat one or two, and then goat one or two are the other options, right? That makes sense. So what we're going to do is we're just going to make an array of those, which you all know how to do, okay? And so what I want you to try to do, and this is why it was important that you have the lecture notebook, um, is can you write a method here that will give us uh, the other goat? Okay, so in other words, we want to know, you know, if we get one of the goats, how do we get the other, like, we want the other one back. All right, does that make sense? Actually, maybe I'll just work through this one. This one's not as interesting. Um, so we're going to say, so if a goat, then, oops, sorry. So we're just going to do an equal, right, to first goat. And then if it's not that, we're going to return second, or if it is that, sorry, we're going to return second goat. And then we would do basically the same thing, except we're going to do it with an LF. Um, and we're going to say a goat equals equals uh, second goat. We're going to return first goat. And this basically lets us do the decider for that last case, right? Or for these cases where we, we know which goat we had. Uh, let me just run these. All right, so then if I run it, we just want to make sure that it works. However, it's going to take forever to load. There we go. 
Um, and as you can see, we don't get anything back if we don't give it a kind of goat, right? Okay, so that's that tells us kind of what happens in the error condition so that we know what to expect. All right, so this is what the one I really wanted you to give a try to, which is, okay, so simulate one contestant making a door choice and what Monty does, the results should be, there should be a period there, the results should be what is behind each door. For example, the sample result is first door, or first goat, second goat, car. So door one, door two, door three. So it comes back as an array of what should be behind each door. But we want to do a random choice, right? So what we want to do is make sure that we're going to start with a contestant choice is either going to be goat one, goat two, or car. But we don't know which one because it'll be random. So in the first case, we want to say the contestant chose the first goat. So then we want to give back Monty's choice, which would be the second slot, right? Which would be second goat, right? And then in the last slot would be the car, which would be uh, in the way I named it was uh, contestant choice, right, is the one, but then Monty underscore choice and then remaining underscore door. All right, so see if you can work on that for a minute. Oh, yeah, I even have the return statement, which has the same name variables. Oh, sorry. Uh, maybe. That one? Uh, yeah. All right. So, can we offer what the first bit would be? So, maybe the first kind of block of content. And yes. Like what's the first thing we need to find out? All right, we need to know if the contestant chose a goat. <laughs> All right. So much like in this other function up here, the first thing we need to do is look at what the contestant chose. So we would start with oops, if contestant. Choice is equal to first go. Then we know what the rest of the results have to be, right? Because we know if they chose the first go, then we have to have Monty's choice being the second go because he's not going to reveal the car, right? Because obviously that would give a lot away. And so the other choice then, the remaining door, <laughs> is going to be, sorry, um, and door, door is going to be the uh, car. All right. So then what's the next block going to be? What's the next option that's really easy? Okay, the second go. So we're going to say LF. Uh, contestant choice is equal to the second note. Then we also know now what Monty's choice and the remaining door have to be, right? He's definitely going to choose the first goat. And then the third door is still going to be the car, right? Because we don't want to reveal the car. Um, now, the last one is where it gets slightly less simple, but it's still pretty easy because we're going to say now Elif, the contestant actually chose the car. Right? So now in this case, 
what will Monty's choice be? Either what? Sorry, I don't know if we said that. Oh, I mean, could you say that? we'll just choose um, either one of the goats. Right. So we have a little uh, array that I think I wrote above, which is the goats. So Monty's choice will be um, MP random choice because we want to have kind of as much randomness in this as possible to kind of feel better about our test, right? That it that this is going to work well. All right. So Monty's choice, and then the remaining door is going to be equal to what? And remember, somebody asked to see the function I described above, or defined above, rather. <laughs> right. So it's just going to be other go with Monty's choice. Right? Because we want Monty's choice to be a. That's cool. We want Monty's choice to be one of the goats, right? And we want the other one to be the other goat, because obviously we can't show the same goat twice. Okay? So that's how we get a function that will accomplish this. And I'm sure I have a typo or two. Oh, I've got a cold problem. And constant, which is a much more common thing to type in a computer than contestant. All right, so now we have our function. Um, and so we can now, well, in theory, I'm sure I spelled it wrong somewhere. Aha. Uh -huh. No, that one's right. Oh, the, the second oh. one. Oh, got it. All right, trying again. All right, cool. All right, so that worked. So if we call this again, right, we should get a different result every time, you know, or we might get repeats or whatever. But now we have a simulated run of the game, right? Does that make sense? Okay, right? so it's really important to be able to try to simulate something like this so that we can find out what are, uh, the, you know, the probability of which one we should choose is. So, because what we want to do is we're, we're going to, what's called brute force test this uh, scenario. So we could go do a math function, right? To actually prove it. But in our case, because we're interested just in the results, we're going to do what's called brute force. Okay. And brute forcing kind of is exactly what it sounds like. So how do you brute force a door? You keep hitting it until it opens. Okay, that's what brute forcing means. You use brute force to do it. So when we have a computer, it's often easy to brute force an answer. So in other words, what we can do is we can just call this method a whole bunch of times, and then we can find out what the probability is of getting the right answer so that we know how to make the right choice. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a table of the games that we're going to simulate. And so we're just going to have a column called guess, a column called revealed, a column called remaining. And you might not have seen us use this technique before, but basically I used made an empty table, but I gave it three columns with labels. Okay. <laughs> and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one simulation of the game to the table by using this append function. All right. And I just pass, or I just call that method, which returns an array. That array is lined up to be the guest, the revealed, and the remaining. Okay, does that make sense? What is append do? It just adds an array in as a new row to a table. Any other questions? Okay, so with our newly used fancy, fancy for loop, I'm just gonna reset the table in the first line there. I'm gonna find where my mouse is. And then I'm going to just say, I want to do it 3,000 times because I want to see how many times I can do it. All right. And this is a little bit of a shortcut. I'm just using this range up to 3,000 rather than um, using a range, but I could use that as well. Um, it's just this is a little bit of a shortcut. And then games.append Monty Paul. All right. And so now, 
I'm going to get a table of 3,000 rows that has all of the time, like I've run the game now 3,000 times, and I have all the results, and it didn't take very long, right? So in this case, right, brute forcing is a lot easier than trying to figure out the mathematical proof for this. So we can brute force it, but then we obviously have 3,000 rows, but let's figure out how can we figure out which is the best choice to make? So we can look at, how can we look at this data differently so that we would know whether, which choice is the best choice to make? Any ideas? What might be useful to know, like we have our guess, and what we wanna know is, is the car most often in our guess, in revealed or in remaining, right? Because that's what we want to know. Well, we know it's not going to be in revealed. How do we get to a bar graph? So we need to do something to the data to be able to make a bar graph, right? Uh, so that's actually creating it, but we have to do something to our table data in order to get something we can put on a bar graph. All right, how about there? Uh, group them so we can count. Right, exactly. So you have the next step, but the first step is we have to group them first. So we're going to say group, and we're going to group by the remaining, because what we want to know is like, if we group it by the remaining, it'll tell us the result of what's in the remaining, right? So 2,000 2, times out of our 3,000 times, it was the car, right? Versus if we stuck with or if we chose it 500 times, we got the first go, and 475 times, we got the second go. Okay, so if you see, this is just whether or not we should choose that, that new door, right, or keep the old door. So what we can do now is we can do a graph to make it a little easier to understand. And for each remaining all right and so you can see from our little simulation that what's the best choice is it to choose the the first door actually we could do this a little bit more interestingly maybe by doing the same thing but with um what do we call the first column with our guests Right, so we can say yes. And of course, the show. Oh no, I wanna, there we go. So this is if we stick with our guess, right? So we get a really even result. But if we go with the new door, right, the remaining door, we get the car two thirds of the time. So it's better to choose the new door or the door that you weren't on before. So the reason that this is, is because unlike the rolling the die, the game actually hasn't changed. It's not a new role because you're still operating with the same original set of choices. So, but because you remove a choice by Monty choosing a door that you know is bad, you've actually reduced the problem to now the remaining door has two thirds of a chance of winning. So it's super confusing, like from a gut feel perspective, but if you, you know, if you kind of work through it, it it's true. Um, so it's one of those places where, you know, the output is not actually what instinctually it seems like it should be. So it's got a cool problem and it shows a little bit of probability. Um, and so that's why we talked about it. Um, and it says, oops. Yeah, okay. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, kind of sampling. So in other words, like what we did was we did 3000 runs the same game. So we kind of, we took a sample from the universe. Right, in the sense that we went and said, let's just play the game 3,000 times and see how we get for a result. Now, sampling is a good 
way to figure out where is the pattern in data or in some data. So sometimes though we already have a data set, right? The data set isn't the whole world of data. Okay. And in this case, we're going to look at um, on time, I think it's arrivals or departures. I can't remember which, um, but it's a fixed set of data. Let me see if I to add anything. Um, and we have this fixed set of data, which is the, you know, the date of the flight, the flight number, the destination, um, that's the airport code, if you haven't seen those before, um, and then the delay, so uh, the departure time delay. Um, you know, interesting side fact, have you, ever, have you ever been on a plane and they pulled away from the gate and they just sat on the tarmac for half an hour, 45 minutes, two hours? Does this ever happen to you? You ever sat on the tarmac? All right, does anybody know why that is? Why they do that? Because they still can count it as an on-time departure if they just go and sit you on the tarmac for two or three hours. Uh, so it still goes in as on time because technically you left the gate just because you can't go anywhere. So what? Um, I used to fly an awful lot. And I am not a big fan of airlines. So the only thing I did to this table was I took the data from the United CSV. And then so that I can kind of show you what's happening, we added a column which is just basically a row counter, okay? So all it did is insert the position of the row into the row itself, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample from this and we wanna know where that came from, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the only thing we did. It's not anything super special and it's really just a convenience. Okay, so what we can look at, right, is we can look at just the data for JFK, say, it is an airport in New York, one of the busiest in the world, um, and regularly, from personal experience, cancels flights to Boston. Destination, oops, comma, JFK. Okay, and so we see, you know, we can pull out just one particular destination, great, whatever, you know, we have this table full of these flight delays and we can do different things to it. So this would be a sample from this data set, right? So we're taking a sample here, but we're constraining it slightly weirdly, right? We're saying, well, for this one airport, okay, well, if we wanna know something about how often the flights are delayed for United, it's probably not legitimate or probably not the best way to do it to, to single out a particular airport. Now, if we wanna ask a different kind of question, for example, how bad are the delays at JFK? then this is a good thing to do. But this is not a good way to go out and get a sample set of the data from the United airline data to figure out if they regularly have delays or what the average delay is. Does that make sense? Right, because what, for all we know, there's something special about JFK, for example, it being a terrible airport that makes it so that they are delayed more often there or less often. So what we want to do is make sure that our samples, when we pull it out of a data set like this, we make sure that the sample is random or as random as it can be. And, and this is what we call sometimes controlling for variables. We want to make sure that we sample correctly. So another example I give a lot is that if you wanted to find out the average salary of uh, people in Boston, okay, what place would be better to find out the average salary of people in Boston is if you went and did your poll in front of City Hall, or in front of a grocery store. What do you think? Grocery store. Why? Because like there's a greater amount of people coming in and out that are like from various backgrounds when you go like in front of city hall, hall or just walk up people. Right. So so you can strain your your sample by doing it in front of city hall because theoretically most of the people going in and out of city hall work for the city, right? Now, City Hall might be a little bit better than, say, you know, standing out front of Whoop, which is this down the street, right? Which would be probably almost all Whoop employees, um, but it's still not going to be great. And something like a grocery store is going to be much better. Why is a grocery store? Sorry, why is a grocery store still not great? Any ideas? shop at different types of grocery stores. Yes, that's one example. And we have any other examples? Uh, that's interesting. An older age group. I hadn't thought of that one. 
Yeah, more like there's a you know, low code scale to face the future. Right. So that's what I tend to think of is that you tend to go to the closest grocery store to where you live, which if you live in an affluent neighborhood, it's going to be a more affluent population, right? And if you live in a less affluent neighborhood, it's going to be a less affluent uh, population. Oh my God, I can't talk to that. All right. So that's what we were talking about there. So in order to do a better job there, we're going to use another new function called take. Okay. The range. And what we're going to do is we're just going to say, sorry, let me just um, type first, then talk. Rows and then 1,000. Okay. So if I do it correctly, we're going to say dot. And so what this is going to do is take takes out a row based on its position. Okay, so the row numbers. Okay, so if you remember, I put the row number in there so we remember what the position was. And we made this array from zero to the total number of rows in the table. And we jumped by 1,000. Okay, so we're going to get a set back of data that is at each of those rows, okay? So that's not terrible, right? It is It is a bit more random, okay, for how we're getting those individual rows. But what I want you to do next, oh yeah, so just as a, to show you a little bit more concretely how you might uh, take works. So I don't think we've used take, right? Um, 34, and then my examples are, <laughs> Okay, so you know you just you basically just pass in a row number and it gives you that row number back or a set of row numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I just use the A range to make my life easier, so I can get uh, a whole bunch of them back at once without having to type them all in manual. Um, so what I want you to take a look at is how could we do the same thing I just did, okay, with the take and the A range, except so I want you know ones that are we only want to get say. Um, 14 of them total, which is how many we got when we did this one up here. And, but we want to introduce more randomness into it. So what do you think you could do to make that work? Okay. And remember, we still have to stay within the constraint of we only have a certain number of rows and we're going to grab by row number, by row number. So we need numbers that are in that set. Any ideas? So the variable name should be big hints. What do you think we could start with that would introduce more randomness? Any ideas? Come on, somebody has to have an idea. Compare it to up here, right? Which is, oops. We compare it to here. Right? What are we using for start? Zero. Zero. So what could we use instead that would introduce more randomness? Random. Somebody over here. Random. So a random choice of what? Uh, a range. Right, but what's the range? How big are each of our jumps? Thousand. Right, so we could say NP random choice, and then we could do NP dot A range of a thousand. Okay, and so that's going to give us a number back, right? That is um, somewhere between zero and a thousand, right? Well, zero and 999. So, and that'll be our starting position. So now what we can do is we can essentially do the same thing we did before, except we can say United take, and now NPA range start United, um, is it forward or is it? Uh -oh. oh my God. All right. And then jump by a thousand still. 
Okay. So theoretically, this could will this always give us 14? Maybe we'll always give us 14. It might be one shy sometimes. Um, okay, so that's at least somewhat more random, right? And so now we're getting, we're not just taking like kind of the same position. So for example, let's say those, all those entries were, there was one per day. Let's say United only did one flight a day. If we did every thousand flight, that might be introducing some regularity that we don't mean to be, right? Because it could be that on every thousandth day, there's a United holiday. And so flights are always delayed that day. Who knows, right? So we want to have some more randomness to it. This gets a little better because we don't start at zero. It's not, you know, it's it's still thousand blocks. So this data and that data have a better chance of being similar than if it was really random, okay? So we have one more function that lets us do a really random job, which is conveniently called sample. So, oops. And if we wanted the same size sample, we would just pass it 14. And now we have much more random data, okay? So that sample function guarantees some more randomness. We could obviously write a better job of this one up here and keep introducing kind of more randomness, right? But going back to when I was talking about randomness with, um, you know, with programming and certain kinds of things in programming, it's better if you, if you use, something that's tested for things like randomness because you have these inherent biases um, that you don't realize that are much better uh, taught by a large group of people. Uh, so that's why we try to use things like sample. It's very convenient. It goes and grabs 14 rows for you. All right. So going back to the slides. All right, so talking a little bit about probability. All right, so uh, hopefully this is most of a review for people. You've probably talked about this at some other you know, schooling, um, but the lowest value on a probability can be zero or is zero, and the highest value is one, okay? Uh, and that is common, a common, common mistake because I will be inclined to ask you what's the highest value and offer 100 as the answer, okay? But 100% is equal to one, not equal to 100, okay? And the reason is, is because when you throw that percent sign on there, you have to imagine that there's a decimal that has been introduced here, okay? So if I take that, that percent sign away, that means I have to put a little period right there. That makes sense? Okay, and often when you have the zero and you're talking about, you know, something that's in terms of percentages like probability, you'll often write 0, 0.00 just to make it clear. But, you know, obviously that's the same value. All right, so uh, kind of, this is kind of a keyword, um, which I should have put my little like magnifying glass on, but complement is the kind of opposite chance. Okay, so in other words, if you have a 70% chance of something happening, the complement is a 30% chance. Um, and so 100% minus 70% is 30%. That's how you get it. Um, and then another way of writing it is with the decimals. Okay. And then I can't remember if we talk about this next. Yeah. So the reason we talk about the complement, and I might have another slide about this later, I can't remember, is because sometimes it's actually easier to figure out the complement, like to calculate the complement, and then get to the actual answer you want by subtracting it from 100. Does that make sense? So think about the fact that the complement is always the, the opposite chance. Uh, and I think actually we have a demo for that. Maybe it's next lecture uh, where we kind of go through, like, you know, if you want to have, you know, if you're pulling from a deck of cards, if you want to figure out what the chances are that you'll get, you know, two red cards if you pull three. <laughs> it might be easier to figure out what chances are of pulling all black cards or something like that. Does that make sense? So we'll talk about it more. Um, and while probability is on the midterm, the uh, complement stuff is not. So, um, okay, so this is how you get to a probability. So it's, uh, so you have to first assume that all outcomes are equally likely. 
Okay, so in other words, um, when you flip a coin, right, it has to be a well balanced coin. It will always be equally likely to come up. Then you have a 50% chance of getting heads and a 50% chance of getting tails. But if you have what's called a loaded head or a loaded die, or sorry, a loaded coin or a loaded die, that's when it when someone's cheating, right? And it will more often hit one side or the other. All right, so they have to be equally likely. So the number of outcomes that makes the thing, whatever you're looking for, happen, divided by the total number of outcomes, okay? All right, so there's also two other rules. One is called the multiplication rule. And so the multiplication rule basically says, okay, uh, going back to my, actually, let's use, um, let's use the coins because they're simple, okay? If I want to say, uh, what are the chances of getting a head followed by a tails, okay, on two flips of the coin? That's where you're going to introduce the, the multiplication rule because you're you're trying to put them together. Um, so if A happens and then B happens given that A has happened, okay? So, and basically it's, it's I'm sure they have a better example, but the answer is less than or equal to each of the two chances being multiplied. So in other words, the, like a way to think about it and kind of test your answer is that it should come out to be it's less likely to happen. So your percent chance of the, the whole event to happen is should be going down. Okay. Or getting closer to zero. But you also have the additional rule. Uh, sorry, the addition rule. Okay. So if it can happen in exactly one of two ways. Okay. So this. Um, you know, like uh, pulling, uh, you know, a queen from a deck of cards, right? And then replacing it and then pulling a king from a deck of cards. But if you're saying either one of those wins, okay? Or like you're, you're pull, you can pull a queen or a king. There you go, that's better. Then your chance is gonna go up, right? So if you think about it in terms of addition, it's that your your percentage should be going up because it's you're basically <laughs> widening your possibilities of, of winning. That make sense? All right, but so from a math perspective, you, you do what it says, right? You multiply them together or you add them together when you have both percentages and you just, you know, kind of do the math, just turn them into decimals and add them up or multiply them. Um, but like I said, the, the rule of thumb is that with if it's a multi multiplicative example, then it should be going down in possibility. And if it's an addition one, it should be going up in possibility. Um, Oh, I think an example there. So um, I think uh, we are getting sound from Zoom. Um, so any outcome except uh, a tail. So this is, a, you know, you're flipping coins, three tosses, and you want any outcome except three tails in a row. It's easier to calculate the reverse, okay? So in other words, you get at least one head, right? If you figure that out, it might be simpler than if you figure out what the actual chance of three tails are. Does that make sense? All right, so some of these are a little esoteric, I know, but it's important to kind of understand what's happening when you're looking at a percentage. Um, you know, when you're looking at, you know, how likely something is to happen, um, you know, I often will, you know, do this math, right, rather than uh, try to understand, like, rather than, like, trying to do it all in my head, like, just actually figure it out. All right. I thought I was supposed to go back to the slides first. Um, all right. So that was sampling. We already did the demo. Um, so we have two kind of keywords here. What I mostly focused on was the random sample, right? Whereas if you have a deterministic sample, that means that you're like selecting from a, from a set. Sometimes that is what you want to do, but not if you're trying to make some sort of evaluation of the set as a whole, okay? So generally speaking, what you want to have is a random sample. Um, and, you know, basically it's like, you can still be random, even if not every person has an equal chance of being selected. Um, but you do need to know what the selection probability is. Uh, so in other words, like 
you need to be aware of where, you know, kind of the bias in your sample choosing is happening so that you're incorporating that into your result or your goal or your problem or whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, but it can still be random, even if some portion of the group has a higher chance of being selected. All right. So the most important part here is, you know, we talked about what it means to be a random sample. And then the keyword for, for a not random sample is usually deterministic sample. And the problem is nine times out of 10 is that people think they have a random sample and it's actually deterministic, okay? Like the city hall and grocery store example, okay? All right, so we have some time left, so it's gonna do the review. Um, so I'm not gonna really cover most of these as much as to say, hey, you should know the data science life cycle, okay? There's this pretty picture. Make sure you know what it looks like and remember what it looks like and where the various stages are. Because um, I'm likely to ask something like, what is step five? All right. Uh, and then there's a bunch of terms, okay? And these are important to kind of have a good idea of what they are. Um, and I would say the most important ones are the ones I have in these review slides, okay? There's a lot of other terms we've covered, um, but kind of having an understanding of what those are is um, probably sufficient. Rather, these you probably want to know more like the definitions of. Okay. So, individuals, treatment, outcome, association, causality, and compounding factors. They're all important terms to actually know what they mean. All right. Um, as I think I've mentioned before, uh, students who do not understand when to use what graph on what scenario is a pet peeve of mine. So it's something I tend to harp on a lot and test a lot. So uh, make sure you know how, which graph to choose. Um, and so categorical, each value is from a fixed inventory. Numerical, each value is a number. Okay, so it's actually a number that can be put on a number line in relationship to the other values. The values can be numerical or categorical. Um, and there's subtypes within numerical and categorical, but those aren't that important. And then distribution is that for every different value of the variable, the frequency of individuals that have that value, okay? So this is also important because distributions are, because we're talking about data science, generally speaking, we're not talking about a data set that is as small, right? As flipping, you know, flipping a few coins or a number of doors to choose goats and cars from. We're normally talking about like the United uh, Airline delays. Um, and even that is actually very small. Most of the data sets we talk about in this class are because they're samples, because we're doing them in a class, they're much smaller than the real data sets, okay? Obviously, as you can imagine, United flies a lot of flights a day, right? If I even got, you know, six months of that data, it has to be way bigger than 14,000, right? So keep that in mind, most of the data sets we use, basically we want performance out of our Jupyter notebooks, et cetera. Uh, and we want you to be able to complete the homeworks and that kind of thing quickly. But that's why distributions, that's why the graphs are also important because looking at a data set that is a million rows is just incomprehensible as is my speaking today. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's why we care so much about those things. All right, and then a couple examples. This is a line graph or a line plot or a plot. Um, it goes by a bunch of different names. Then we have a scatter plot or a scatter uh, or a scatter diagram. Um, and they represent different things. So this is, you're trying to look for maybe a trend line. That scatter, you tend to be looking for something that's more like a correlation. Like you want to know the relationship between one thing and another, okay? And then we have bar graphs um, and the kind of, you know, the categories go across the bottom and then we have um, the kind of values are going up the side and the differentiator between a histogram and a bar graph is usually the gaps, okay? So if, you're, if even if it's unlabeled, you can usually tell one from the other because one will have gaps in it and the other one doesn't. Um, another way of putting this, this, this is bins, right? Or buckets or whatever you want to call those. Uh, and then this is the percentage in that bucket or count. And that's, that's the thing I find a little complicated about histograms is that that, uh, whatever that is, the y-axis um, can be either a percentage of the overall thing, or it can be the actual count. All right. 
may be done early today. All right, so then the other one is pivot tables. So remember, grouping is incredibly important. Um, and then understanding the data as, you know, this is a common kind of term in data science, computer science, even stats, um, to kind of turn data into information. Pivot tables are really good at making information, um, but they, they take some processing to get to. Um, but pivot tables are usually very useful, um, but it's important to remember how they work. Okay, that you have, you know, column A, right, column B, and then somewhere in here is a calculated value based on the inputs from column A and column B for that particular cell. Okay. All right, methods and functions. We've been doing this a bunch already, um, but remember, uh, you know, this is the name of your method. These are your arguments or parameters. Um, this is a basically this whole thing is the is the body, and then the part that's after the return is referred to as the return expression. Okay, and so we'll kind of keep those terms in mind. Um, the other thing to remember, right, is that you can use the name and pass it around, right? So you can, for example, in the apply function, you can pass the name of a method directly. Okay, so. And the indicator that you're doing that is that you don't have parentheses. Okay. All right. And then we have uh, the collectors or collections. Um, and so we have arrays, which in the case of this class are values of the same type. Okay. And lists, which are also a sequence of values, but of different types, or maybe different types, maybe the same type. You don't have any guarantee about which type it is. Um, and then a group collects rows by some column. I will say groups, uh, you know, in the group function is something that we use a lot, uh, both in the midterm and then throughout the rest of the course. So group is something to make sure you understand. I would say group and apply both are very, very common. Um, the next thing uh, we will be doing a lot more where we use if and else, as well as for loops going forward, right? Because you just saw an example where we wanted to simulate a scenario, right? Let's say we wanted to simulate the United flight data. Okay, we could write a method that would, you know, take random numbers of a certain amount of uh, uh, departure delay, and then we could simulate a huge amount of data about flight delays. We don't know necessarily how accurate it would be, but we have ways to try to figure that out. So we'll be using for loops and if statements, et cetera, a lot to be able to simulate scenarios. Okay, so those are important to know pretty well. Um, and then probability, which we just talked about. Um, I think this concise slide is, is kind of almost clearer because it kind of puts them all together. Um, and then lastly uh, is joins, okay? So as I kind of talked about before, you know, you've got two tables, you want to make them connect together. You got to find something that is common between them and you have to connect them on that common thing. Okay. And that's kind of how joins work. Uh, yeah. Does column or does table length matter with joining tables? It can. So it depends on where the length difference is. So as long as every element on your joining component match, like as long as there's one, at least one of each one. Then it's okay. So, like, if you look at these, right? These are two different table lengths, but the joining column, cafe and and location, each of these appears here, right? So you have to make sure they they map, but otherwise they can be of different lengths. Okay. Yeah. Will we have to manipulate tables to make them match on the midterm? Uh, I. I'm going to say 99% chance no. Um, I, I can't, I don't even know if we have an example of doing that in the class. So we don't, it's interesting. Joins are really, really important, but we actually don't use them that much in this class um, because more, it, we're more talking about taking a single kind of data set and manipulating it into doing like predictions or like trying to understand a pattern in it. We're not doing as much stuff where we're saying, okay, we got these 16 different tables and we need to get them all together and then look at a prediction. Okay. That'll be more, that'd be the kind of more senior classes as you get further along. 
Any other questions? All right. Let's see, I think I have to show up my attribution slide uh, just because I stole some pictures. Um, but uh, yeah, if uh, no other questions. All right, well, then I will see you on Tuesday. Remember, the midterm is here. Okay.